Welcome and join us as we take a closer look at daylight saving time. It's something uh, you probably experience twice a year. Oh yeah, definitely. But might not know much about. Exactly. We're talking about that twice yearly clock change. Right. Yeah. Setting things forward an hour during the warmer months. Yeah. And the idea is to shift daylight hours. Okay. Giving you more evening sunlight. Yeah. Makes sense. It's fascinating to consider that this wasn't always the norm. You're telling me it feels so ingrained in our lives. I know, right? But DST has a surprisingly recent and kind of quirky history. It really does. Yeah. To understand how we got here, we need to go back to some early ideas okay. that weren't quite DST as we know it. So people were already playing with the idea of time shifting even before it became common practice. Believe it or not, one of the earliest examples involves Benjamin Franklin. Oh, wow. The same guy who flew a kite in a thunderstorm. Wait, Ben Franklin was into time, too. Yeah. I thought he was all about electricity and diplomacy. Uh, he was a man of many interests. Back in 1784, he wrote a humorous essay. Oh, wow. Suggesting that Parisians could save money on candles by waking up earlier. Okay, I can see the logic. Yeah. Earlier sunrise, less need for artificial light. Exactly. Was this the first seed of DST? Not exactly. It was more of a funny thought experiment mm -hmm. than a serious proposal. Okay. But it does show that people were thinking about how we use daylight even back then. So it was a step towards understanding the relationship between our schedules and the sun. Right. Even if it wasn't formal clock shifting. Precisely. And it's a good reminder that these ideas we take for granted often have a long and winding history. Absolutely. So if Ben Franklin wasn't pushing for official clock changes, who actually took that first step? The first place to actually shift clocks forward by an hour was Thunder Bay, Canada in 1908. Canada. That's not where I expected this story to go. Yeah. What was the reasoning behind it? The specific reasons aren't well documented. Okay. But the fact that this small community took the initiative is important. It shows that even on a local level, people were looking for ways to make the most of daylight hours. Absolutely. It's a testament to the power of local innovation. Yeah, for sure. Now, it's important to note that DST didn't catch on globally right away. Okay. It took a major global event to really push it into the spotlight. World War I. Uh-huh. I can see how wartime necessity would drive all sorts of changes. You got it. Wartime needs often drive innovation, and that was certainly true for timekeeping. Think about it. Longer daylight hours meant less need for artificial lighting. Right. Which was crucial for conserving resources. So something we often complain about today was actually born out of a critical wartime need. That's right. In 1916, Germany and Austria-Hungary implemented DST to conserve fuel. Wow. And the impact was almost immediate. Oh, wow. The UK and US followed suit pretty quickly. So even during a global conflict, countries were willing to coordinate something as fundamental as time. Exactly. It highlights how World War I had a massive impact on daily life, even down to how people structured their days. The U.S. officially adopted DST on March 19, 1918 through the Standard Time Act. So before that, was it a bit of a free-for-all with time across the country? You could say that. Different regions often had their own local time, okay. which caused a lot of confusion, especially for train schedules and communication. It makes sense that a standardized system would be beneficial. So World War I brought us DST. Did it stick around after the war ended? It's interesting it didn't. After the war, public support for DST decreased. There was opposition from various groups, including farmers, who found it disruptive to their routines. It's easy to forget that a seemingly simple change like shifting the clock can have a ripple effect on so many aspects of life. It absolutely does. Congress actually repealed the U.S. DST law in 1919. Really? Leaving it up to individual states to decide whether to observe it or not. So we were back to a patchwork system with different parts of the country on different schedules? Unfortunately, yes. And that lack of uniformity brought back many of the problems that the Standard Time Act had tried to solve. But if DST faded after World War I, it must have made a comeback, right? You're on the right track. It took another global conflict, World War II, to bring DST back to the forefront. With the need for resource conservation again playing a key role, I imagine. Exactly. President Roosevelt reintroduced DST on February 9, 1942. Okay. And get this. Okay. It was implemented as wartime. Wow. Which was essentially year-round DST until 1945. Wow. So no springing forward or falling back for those years. It shows just how serious the government was about conserving energy during the war effort. Absolutely. And it paved the way for how DST would be implemented in the years to come. So two world wars, two rounds of DST. It sounds like a clear pattern. 
But I have a feeling the story doesn't end there, does it? You're right. The post-World War II period was a bit chaotic when it came to timekeeping in the U.S. Even though DST was back, there was no national standard. So we were back to the pre-Standard Time Act days, with states and towns making their own rules. Essentially, imagine traveling across state lines and experiencing multiple time changes on a short trip. Oh my gosh. It was a logistical nightmare. Yeah. For businesses, transportation, broadcasting, you name it. I can only imagine the headaches that caused. There had to be a better way. There was, and it came in the form of the Uniform Time Act of 1966. This aimed to standardize DST across the country. Finally, some order to the time chaos. So what exactly did the Uniform Time Act lay out? It established a clear schedule. DST would start on the last Sunday in April and end on the last Sunday in October. It was a huge win for simplifying timekeeping and ensuring everyone was on the same page. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Businesses, travelers, everyone must have breathed a sigh of relief. You bet. But there was a twist. While the act established a national standard, right. it also allowed states to opt out completely if they passed their own legislation. Wait, so states could just say thanks but no thanks to DST even after all that effort to standardize things? Exactly. And that's why even today you have some states that don't observe DST. The most well-known examples are Arizona and Hawaii. I'm guessing they had their reasons for going their own way. They did. Arizona, with its intense desert heat, found that extending daylight into the evening would make things even hotter Fine and not. increase energy consumption for air conditioning. Right. They decided sticking with standard time made more sense for them. It's fascinating how geography and climate play a role in these decisions. Yep. What about Hawaii? Their reasoning was different. Being so close to the equator, they have fairly consistent daylight hours throughout the year. Oh, okay. So shifting the clock wouldn't have much of an impact. So even with the Uniform Time Act, there's still some time zone variety across the U.S. That's right. And the story doesn't end there. The Uniform Time Act itself has been amended several times since 1966. For example, the start date of DST was shifted from the last Sunday in April to the first Sunday in April in 1986. So even after trying to standardize things, they were still tweaking the system. Exactly. And the Energy Policy Act of 2005 had a major impact, okay. extending DST to its current schedule, okay. which is the second Sunday in March to the first Sunday in November. So those longer stretches of DST that we experience today are a relatively recent development. They are. And the most fascinating part of all this, even though DST has been around for over a century and we have this seemingly standardized system, it's still a topic of debate. Really? People are still arguing about springing forward and falling back. What are the main points of contention? There are arguments on both sides. Some people argue that DST saves energy by reducing the amount of electricity needed for lighting in the evenings. That makes sense. Aligning our schedules with daylight hours. Right. To reduce our reliance on artificial light. Exactly. But others argue that any energy savings from lighting are offset by increased use of air conditioning. Oh, yeah. As people try to cool down their homes during those longer, warmer evenings. So it's a trade-off. Saving energy on lighting, mm -hmm. but potentially using more on cooling? Precisely. And then there are the health concerns. Some studies suggest that the abrupt time change in spring can disrupt our sleep patterns mm. and even increase the risk of heart attacks and strokes. So our bodies might struggle to adjust to that sudden shift in daylight hours. That's the idea. Mm. And then there's the impact on mood and mental health. Some people report feeling more depressed or anxious during the transition to and from DST. It sounds like there's no easy answer when it comes to the overall impact of DST. That's right. It's a complex issue with valid arguments on both sides. And the debate is likely to continue as we learn more about the effects of time changes on our bodies and our energy consumption. It's fascinating to think that something as seemingly simple as changing the clock can have such far-reaching consequences. It really highlights the interconnectedness of our lives and the world around us. And it makes you appreciate the constant evolution of something we often take for granted. Absolutely. It's clear that DST is more than just springing forward and falling back. Mm. It's a reflection of our history, our energy needs, and even our health and well-being. And as we continue to learn and adapt, it's possible that the way we observe DST might continue to evolve in the years to come. It's a reminder that even something as established as our timekeeping system is subject to change and debate. Exactly. It makes you think about all the other aspects of our lives that might seem fixed but are actually in constant flux. Well, after this exploration of DSD, I'll never look at changing my clock the same way again. I think that's the beauty of taking a closer look at the things we often take for granted. It opens up a whole new world of understanding and appreciation.
Absolutely. And speaking of appreciation, let's shift our focus for a moment. You might be surprised to learn that daylight saving time wasn't always the universally accepted practice it is today. I'm all ears. What other perspectives have shaped how we think about time? Well, for a significant period, the United States went through a time when DST wasn't federally mandated. Okay. It was a period of experimentation and inconsistency. Sounds like a recipe for confusion. <laughs> when was this and what led to such a system? It was after World War I. The initial enthusiasm for DST waned, and Congress repealed the wartime DST law in 1919. So did that mean no more DST for the entire country? Not exactly. The repeal effectively shifted the decision to observe DST to individual states. So a bit like a patchwork system where some states were on DST and others weren't. You got it. It was a period of great inconsistency with different parts of the country operating on different time schedules. I can't imagine that was easy for businesses or travelers crossing state lines. It wasn't. Just imagine planning train schedules or long distance phone calls when you couldn't be certain what time it was in another state. It must have been a logistical nightmare. It was. This lack of uniformity had several negative consequences, okay. including disrupting interstate commerce and causing widespread confusion. So this period of state-by-state -state DST highlights the importance of standardization for a smoothly functioning society. Exactly. And it set the stage for the eventual push towards a unified national system, which we'll get into a bit later. I'm eager to hear how that happened. But before we move on, I'm curious about the reasons why some states chose to abandon DST altogether during that period. There were various factors at play. In some states, particularly those with significant agricultural industries, farmers found DST disruptive to their routines. I can see how shifting the clock could interfere with the natural rhythms of farming. Absolutely. And in other states, there was public resistance to the idea of changing the clocks, often rooted in tradition or a desire to stay aligned with solar time. It sounds like there were genuine concerns and differing priorities at play. That's right. And these different perspectives ultimately contributed to the patchwork system that emerged in the aftermath of World War I. It's fascinating to see how something as seemingly straightforward as timekeeping can become a complex tapestry of political, economic, and even cultural considerations. It really highlights how even the most fundamental aspects of our lives are shaped by a multitude of factors. Well, now I'm even more curious to hear how the U.S. eventually transitioned from this patchwork system to a more unified approach to DST. That transition was a gradual process, driven by the increasing need for standardization in a rapidly modernizing world. I can imagine that as transportation and communication technologies advance, the drawbacks of a fragmented time system would have become more apparent. Exactly. The rise of air travel, for example, made it increasingly problematic to have different time zones within a single country. It's easy to see how that would lead to scheduling conflicts and general chaos. You bet. And as interstate commerce grew, businesses also began to push for a more uniform system to simplify transactions and logistics. So the economic benefits of standardization started to outweigh the resistance to change. That's right. And alongside these practical considerations, there was a growing sense that a unified time system would contribute to national unity and efficiency. So DST became more than just a matter of timekeeping. It was tied to ideas of national identity and progress. Exactly. And these various factors eventually culminated in the passage of the Uniform Time Act of 1966, right. which we discussed earlier. So the Uniform Time Act marked the end of the patchwork system and the beginning of a more standardized approach to DST in the U.S. That's right. It was a significant step towards creating a more unified and efficient time system for the entire country. But as we've already seen, the story doesn't end there. Even with the Uniform Time Act in place, the debate over DST continues to this day. It does. And it's likely to remain a topic of discussion as we learn more about the potential impacts of time changes on our health, energy consumption, and overall well-being. It's a reminder that even seemingly subtle issues can resurface as new information and perspectives emerge. Absolutely. And it speaks to the dynamic nature of society itself, constantly adapting and reevaluating its practices in light of new knowledge and changing priorities. Well, this exploration of DST has certainly opened my eyes to the complexity and fascinating history behind something I used to take for granted. It's amazing what you can discover when you take a closer look at the seemingly mundane aspects of our lives. I couldn't agree more. It makes you realize that there's a story behind everything, even the way we tell time. Exactly. And those stories often reveal fascinating insights into our history, our values, and our evolving understanding of the world around us. This has been an incredibly illuminating look at Daylight Saving Time. 
I feel like I have a much deeper appreciation for its significance. I'm glad to hear that. It's always rewarding to delve into the often overlooked aspects of history and uncover the unexpected connections they hold. Well, on that note, I'm eager to hear what other fascinating topics you have in store for us in future episodes. I have a feeling you'll be pleasantly surprised. We have a whole lineup of captivating subjects waiting to be explored. I can't wait. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you'll join us again when we take a closer look at another great topic.